All right, so it's Wednesday. What does that mean? Max. Okay, good. So this is going to be uh, our first uh, shift from Ableton to talking about uh, another tool, which is uh, Max. Okay. Um, you guys did a reading, which brings me to my first point. The reading responses. Uh, the Blackboard system is working again. Uh, but I did have a few people email me about some annoying features. Yes. Uh, is anyone else troubled by this autosave feature that seems to s constantly move where your cursor is on the page? Okay. So yeah. Um, I almost feel like this alone is a reason to maybe pivot and sh shift to using the Google surveys. Okay. My question for you guys, because I, I admit that's pretty annoying. Uh, on my end, it's actually pretty annoying for me. I can't get aggregate responses from free response questions, which is the majority of the questions. I can't just say, show me all the answers to question number four and have them just appear in a list. It won't let me do that, basically. Um, so my question for you guys is, if we move to the Google uh, survey system, uh, I need to record the fact that you individually have done it some way. Um, and I need to do it in a way that is going to, I don't know, encourage honesty, right? Uh, not have people answering for each other or doing it multiple times with their neighbors, friends, and that sort of stuff. Because the honor system still applies even though we're not using Blackboard, yes? Okay. So my question for you is, what would you feel more comfortable putting into a Google form? Your 800 number or your name? <laughs> and your your bank account with the routing number and everything too. Okay, yeah. I mean, what it it does it make you uncomfortable to put your eight hundred number into a Google form or no? No. Oh, okay. Um, I I felt I feel like eight hundred number might be a little bit more. I don't know. Encourage honesty a little bit more, shall we say? Because uh, you'd have to give your eight hundred number to someone else who could then I don't know. Use it well. No, we don't use eight hundred numbers for log. We used to use eight hundred numbers for logging on to my.stetson.edu, and you basically were giving someone access to your like course login and that sort of stuff when you gave them an eight hundred number. But we don't do that anymore. Now it's all email login. Um, or should I just use name or I don't know. Name's fine with me. Name's fine with you. Okay. I don't care. Okay. Um, if I do name, I could probably even set it up as a drop down list where you just simply drop down and. Pick, pick your name from the list, basically, because everybody will be there. I was thinking of not doing that because it's easier to accidentally put the name right above or below the word. Okay. Is that yeah. Okay, can we do, because um, we have two people, well, we have Marcus over there, and then you go by Marcus as well, so I'll just need to make sure I put last initial for you guys. Do we have any other two same names? No, I don't think we do. Okay, um, or you guys will need to put your last initials. Okay, can you guys can Marcus and Marcus agree that just make sure you include your last initial, or you can use your your given name. Yeah. Okay, either way. Um, okay, so just do. I I will set that up. I let's see. I should be able to set that up for Friday, but if I don't, if you don't see an email message from me with a link to a Google survey or in a, a change in Blackboard, go ahead and use the link for the Blackboard quiz um, for Friday, basically. But by next week, I want to switch over to the Google survey because uh, I, I don't get I, the, the survey thing that I showed you where I can see all the aggregate answers. That's really what I want uh, is being able to see like what people are thinking. Uh, it might also mean that I need to uh, change the the one about how many minutes did you spend on this reading to like a, a a range. So like it might be something like zero to twenty, twenty to forty, forty to sixty, sixty plus something like that. Okay, because um, I really am interested as far as like how it, I don't know. That's that's one measure of the difficulty of a reading. Yes, how many how many minutes you spend on the reading, right? Okay, it's some might say it's it's a measure of your, the amount of time you invest in the reading too, because so it's 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 measuring two different things. Yes, um, but I, I do want to uh, migrate us over to that format. I, I hopefully we'll get it done by Friday. If not, I'll work on that. Um, my other question, I guess, uh, just procedural, is this? Um, uh, I don't know. My my 
my plan here in the early going is to do these kind of in-class demos, right, where I'm walking you through something and you're following along, uh, pausing to explain things conceptually. Uh, is that a format you like? Because I know some folks, uh, some professors and some uh, people will record the demo ahead of time and then it's a, like a shorter demo and they can do kind of like an activity in class or would you, which, which format do you, do you prefer having, being live in the room with me stepping through something on the software rather than watching a, a, a video that's done in advance? Yeah. I'm seeing head nods around the room. Okay. Okay. We'll stick with that format. Um, if it gets to the point where you get, feel like, okay, we, we spent 50 minutes on something that I could have easily done in 10 minutes, uh, feel free to come talk to me because I, I want to know, I want to get the format for this class right, okay, because we're learning a lot of stuff and make sure that you uh, are, are able to review that stuff. Again, the recordings make it possible for you to go back and review. Um, if you missed something in the demo or you felt like it went too quickly in class, you can kind of step through it. Um, or if you just simply forget something. I know Dr. Wallet covered that in week one. Where was that? And I do, uh, if you haven't looked at the YouTube feed, I do put in the notes like time markers for significant points in the class, basically. So it should make it easier to jump to specific points of like where the demo starts so you don't have to fast forward through 20 minutes of me jabbering at the beginning of class, okay? So that gets us to our topic for today, which is Cycling 74 Max, okay? Uh, and I actually thought that uh, Marcus came up with a pretty good definition of what Max is, uh, right? You, you put this as your response for what would the point of the reading, okay? Um, so and I'm asking you to put it in your own words, okay? So. A digital workspace for creating a personal digital instrument. Okay, and is that a good work, working definition of what? Okay, I don't know. We, we we don't necessarily need the word digital in there twice, right? We can kind of put it uh, one place or the other, right? But does that give, does that kind of encapsulate what your conception of Max is at this point? Okay, um, with the, so I. Could, thank you, Marcus, for giving us a good definition of what Max is and what Max does, okay? Um, with this kind of caveat, I will say, this idea that it's a workspace, uh, it is a very deep workspace, okay? Uh, you can spend a lot of time in Max and not know all of the, the, cor the corners, uh, the dusty corners of, of Max, the things that it does, the things that it's capable of. Uh, I, like I said uh, earlier on, I've been spending, I've been working with Max for 20 years. Uh, they keep adding new components, and then there's still components that I've never gotten around to using in various projects. Okay, um, so don't feel like, don't think that you're going to master Max in this one class, in this one semester. Definitely not in this one class, this class session today, basically, but this one course, shall we say. Uh, it is something that is, is deep and open-ended because people are constantly making new objects for it, new components for it, new pieces that interface with it. Uh, and so it just, uh, it does a good job of accepting all of these pieces and parts and being the glue that ties them all together, basically. So that's, that's what I like about Max and what makes it such a rich environment. Um, before I get to kind of walking you through building something with Max today, which is what we're going to do, um, I, I had this graphic on my slides frequently on Monday, yes? Okay, you may have noticed this pattern that I was talking about, okay? Um, and in Ableton, what were some of the, the items? I'm trying to make sure I, I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully here. What were some of the items that we talked about having this kind of pattern? Daniel? Well, what were some of the elements of Ableton Live on Monday that we talked about having this kind of pattern? Solomon. Uh, plugins. Yeah, plugins, right? Specifically, what kinds of plugins? I heard it. MIDI effects, effects yes. And audio. audio effects, yes. Okay. And starts with an I. Instruments, right? Ableton is what Ableton calls them. They're instruments, okay? Um, so we have this kind of pattern where we're talking about we're talking about some form of input. We're talking about what the device does to that input and the type of output that we get, okay? Um, we can talk about the same pattern in a Max environment, okay? Except that the 
the thing in the middle changes from being an, a MIDI effect, an audio effect, or an instrument to being an object. Okay? Objects are the core component of a max patch. Okay? Uh, and we have inputs and outputs, and we talk about what the object is doing in response to the input and what kind of output it's then producing. Does that make sense? Okay. That's part of my reason for highlighting this pattern is because when we move to the max environment, although in Ableton we kind of visualize it this way down at the bottom, right? In max it turns around a little bit and we go vertically down the patch, right? Okay, we start at the top and we move down through the patch, okay? Um, and that's actually part of part, something that you need to understand. If, you've, uh, if you're coming from a, a place where you have experience with line coding, right? In line coding, uh, in like Java or processing or C or C++, and we'll, I'll get to what C is because some of you had questions about that, right? Um, things happen in order, right? Line one happens, then line two happens, then line three happens, okay? In a two-dimensional programming environment, right? which is what max is, essentially, how do you decide what happens first, what happens second, what happens third, okay? Do you guys, did that uh, come up in the reading at all? Did that, that point come across in the reading, deciding how things happen in, the, in, in order, or was that kind of on the periphery? Yeah, mini in, mini parse, mini out, okay? And you may have noticed that when uh, it, the textbook, right, was building that patch, it started at the top and it moved down through the patch, okay? So that's kind of the program flow. There is also, because it's two-dimensional, there needs to be another way to handle it as well, is what sequence do things happen from left to right? And I guess I should do it this way. It actually happens from, I have to do it backwards for you guys. It hap ordering, if things are, at the same Y position down the patch, things happen from right to left, or for you guys, right to left. Okay, that's what I was screwing me up here. Basically, I was trying to do it the right direction for you guys, okay? So top to bottom, right to left, okay, is the order that things happen in this two-dimensional max environment. Um, that may not be obvious right away, but there are some problems that you can solve by simply stepping back and thinking about, okay, what's the right to left order in this patch and the, the order that things are happening in, okay? It will come up, I guarantee, at some point this semester for somebody in this room. It's just, just the law of averages and the number of people we have in here working with Max, okay? Um, now, in Ableton, we were talking about different types of information, right? Okay, I, I made sure on the first day to recap MIDI and digital audio, right, and the different traits that it has and just understanding the distinctions between these two types of information, okay. It gets a little more complicated in Max because Max deals with more types of information than this and more foundational types of information than just simply MIDI and audio, okay. Um, integers, floats, lists. Uh, integers and floats should be uh, floats, uh, floating point numbers, right? Uh, especially if you've had the intro to computing class, you sh these, should, these should ring a bell, yes? Okay, it's closer to a programming environment, okay, uh, in terms of the, num the types of uh, pieces of information that it deals with, okay? Uh, lists are kind of a special thing that they are, they are a, a, a uh, similar to an array, if you remember talking about arrays in the intro to computing class or your intro, uh, if you've taken intro to programming, uh, a list is, uh, actually this, I've got a list right here on my patch, this one right here is a list, okay? It's nothing more than a list of things separated by spaces, okay? Um, we have messages and symbols. There are, there's audio that can be passed in between objects. Uh, as you get into jitter, there's video matrices that can be passed between objects and those video matrices can be either frames of video or they can be OpenGL things, so you can actually do OpenGL rendering inside of the Max environment. Uh, for those of you that are taking uh, things related to, uh, what, is anybody taking 3D animation in here? Nobody's taking 3D animation in here? Wow, okay. 3D animation's being offered. Uh, you could work with somebody who's a 3D animator, have them render out your object, and then Max could, you could build a Max patch to interactively move that object, basically, okay? Um, so it's possible to do a lot of stuff in Max, okay? Uh, we're going to be using it primarily to build our own um, plugins for the Ableton environment, okay? Uh, some of you might gravitate toward building the solution just in Max, but for I, I want to make sure that you at least get the experience building uh, plugins that you can use inside the, 
the um, Ableton environment, whether those be MIDI effects, whether those be audio effects, or whether those be instruments. Okay, you can build all of those things using Max, Max for Live. Okay, um, and so again, this pattern is going to come up. So let me transition from here to the Max environment. Okay, where is it at? I have it up here. Okay, if you don't have Max launched, go ahead and launch Max. Max is this little seven icon at the bottom. Okay, we are going to be running Max today separately from the Ableton environment. Okay, um, it is possible to go back and forth between these two things, but we get a few extra save features in the Max environment for when we're just kind of learning it. Okay, but if you learn how to patch in the Max environment, it's it's exactly the same when you patch in the Max for Live environment. Okay, um, so. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, open a new patch. Okay, so I'm going to do Apple N. I'm going to make mine nice and big so everybody can see it in the back of the room. Okay, I'm going to fill up the screen. And I'm going to make it uh, larger. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as the so you actually had two readings last night. Okay, and uh, uh, there there was the chapter in the book. Uh, and then there was the article by David Ziccarelli, okay, who is the the lead on the company that uh, produces Max, okay, um, and he uses this kind of tongue-in-cheek title for the article. Anybody knows? Uh, what now? Yeah, how I learned to love a program that does nothing, basically. Okay, so I mean, he means it kind of tug in cheek that it does nothing by default. It shows you nothing by default. Everything gets out of the way. It's up to you to build the patch in the Max environment and to create something. Okay, so it it's it is the proverbial blank piece of paper, basically. Okay, um, that's the structure that the Max patch, uh, the Max environment uses. Okay, is anybody having problems booting Max? Yeah. Uh, trial not started. Trial not started. Yeah. Go ahead and start the trial. We have enough. Co we we are authorized users. Uh, I will talk to Ryan about. Um, to create new accounts. Or oh man. Uh, no, we shouldn't have to do that. Awesome. Okay, so we can't. Okay. Um, you've got it open. How did you get it open? I clicked on it and I hit new patch. Okay. Oh, I got it. Just close that. Yes. So just close the authorization window and then you can keep using the patch. Yeah. And saving will be disabled until we get this authorized. Sorry. Okay, I'll save my patch at the end of class and make sure you guys have access to it. Okay. Um, so, uh, real quickly, if you are someone that, uh, if you need, again, I, I pointed out on live where you can get to the interactive demos that show you how to use the environment in the environment. Okay. Uh, Max has something similar. If you go to the help up here, there's what's called the Max Tour. Okay. Uh, you can do that on your own time. You can walk through that. Uh, it has three choices like, no, I don't know anything. Yes, I already know how to use it. Get out of my way and, and just show me what's new. And uh, when it says show me what's new, it's, it's show me what's new in Max 7. So that's meant for people that have been using Max versions 1 through 6 and just want to know what the new features are in Max 7, which there were a lot of upgrades in Max 7, okay? Um, okay, so we have our basic patcher window, okay, and I can actually create new patcher windows if I want to actually create multiple patches, okay, and I can run them all at the same time, and they can actually be talking to one another. Your Max environment can get pretty complex having patches talk to patches and that sort of thing, okay. Let's focus on just one for now, okay, and in this you're going to be using... Let's see, if you're a mouse kind of person, not a keyboard kind of person, okay, you're going to get used to using this toolbar at the top, uh, as well as there's toolbars down the side and, and the bottom, okay, both sides and the bottom. But the one at the top is where we actually use uh, to create new objects, okay. So I can actually click where it says object here, okay, and it actually will show you keystrokes as well right with that item, okay. So if you need the, 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 the prompt, the reminder to actually know what the keystrokes are, okay, I can click and drag a new object down to the patch, okay? So if you're someone that's more of a, of a, um, 
mouse dependent variety. Okay, that's the, the process for creating a new object. Everybody's able to do that? Yes? Okay. Um, now, let's see. What should we do for our first object? Well, let's do, uh, let's do cycle tilde. Okay. If you're not, this was not covered in the, the chapter, okay? The idea of certain objects end with this special character that looks kind of like a, well, a tilde, yes, in, in Spanish, but what in audio, what would this maybe evoke? Yeah, waveform, right? Okay, you see this kind of waveform shape, okay? Where is the tilde key on your keyboard? Yeah, under the escape key on your keyboard, okay? So if you're not used to using the tilde, okay, make sure you know where it is, okay? Because all of the audio objects, all of the objects that produce audio output or process audio end in this tilde character. That's the way that they distinguish themselves from other non-audio objects, okay? It's called tilde, T-I-L-D-E, okay? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and create the cycle tilde object. And you may have noticed one thing. I'll do this again real quick. When I started typing, there's this autocomplete feature, okay, where it tries to guess what it is uh, that I'm, what object I'm trying to add to the environment, okay, to the patch, which is a handy thing if you kind of remember, I think that object begins with C. Okay, well then here's all the objects that begin with C, okay? <laughs> Or have a C in them, because there's even some, yeah, this one doesn't begin with C, but there's a C in the name, okay? Um, so you're going to get a lot of options here. The more that you type, the closer you get to the actual object, okay? Uh, I will point this out. There is, and there's one reason to make sure I, hi I highlight, there is a cycle object without a tilde and a cycle with a tilde, okay? One of them makes audio. One of them does something completely different, okay? Uh, so we need the cycle tilde object, okay? Um, and if we want to know what an object does, did you get this from the reading? I'm trying to remember if this is covered in the reading. Okay, I don't think it is. How do you get how do you get how to get help on a specific object? Okay, um, what is interesting about Max is that it is a self-documenting environment. Okay, you actually open patches that show you how objects work. Okay. So in order to get to the help patch, you'll hear me talk about help patches for this specific object or any object. Yeah, you're raising your hand, Hunter? Yeah, you can either right click on it, and it's the first option there, okay? Or you can option click on it, and it will open up the help patch, okay? And as I said, this is not a static documentation. This is not a PDF file. This is not a text document. This is a live working max patch, which shows you what the object does. Okay, so I can actually turn on this patch, and I should be able to uh, get some sound. I need to turn it up, and then turn up this. So I've got a working program here that shows me what this object does, okay? That I think is one of the coolest things about Max, especially if you're new to program or programming, newer to programming, is that the, do the environment actually documents itself with working patches, okay? Every object has one of these help patches which shows you what the object does, okay? So you're never more than a, a quick click away from an interactive demo of what something does, okay? Uh, get in the habit of using that. I mean, I do this all the time, basically, if I forget, because I cannot memorize what all of these objects do, basically. Uh, opening up the help patch, seeing what it does. You've got the interactive demo here. You've got uh, information here about arguments, messages that it understands, specifics of the environment. And then if, if you're someone that absolutely needs to read some text, I think it's, uh, where'd it go? Uh, 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 uh. No, it's not another lesson. No. There is also a there should there is also a text file somewhere. I have to go get uh, figure out where where you get that. Usually, this is enough because there's enough text in here, and then you can actually play around with it, use it, and figure out what it's doing. Okay. Um, and then there's also uh, tabs at the top here, which will show you different features. So these, uh, this 
basic phase buffering. Okay. Okay. So you've uh, looked at, at this enough. What does a cycle object do? Periodic waveform, okay? That's important, right, when we're talking about basic electronic music synthesis, yes? Having these periodic waveforms, okay? What is sometimes called an oscillator, okay? Uh, and you could have, we could have called this an oscill object or an oscillator object. It's called cycle because it cycles through the waveform, okay? So we're going to build our patch around this basic waveform, okay? Uh, the cycle object, okay? Uh, now, in the Max environment, we don't just have objects. We also have messages and comments, which I think a few people asked about, right? Uh, Victoria, you were asking about the differences between messages and objects. Okay. Okay. So hopefully we can clarify that uh, right now. Okay. Um, or did anybody else? Did anybody else confused by that in the reading or their previous experience with Max? What now? Uh, okay. So good question. Are, is an object an instrument? Okay. I would answer that by saying. Typically, an object is going to be a lower level than a complete instrument, okay? And it's going to be up to you to connect objects to build your instrument. So it's like a string Yeah, it's a piece of an instrument, okay? Uh, I don't think anybody would say that this, op this cycle object by itself is a complete instrument, right? We need some hooks to be able to connect with it, okay? Uh, but we can do that all in the max environment and build our instrument around it, okay? So, let's see. I want to get some sound out of my cycle object in this patch, okay? I'm going to go ahead and create a new object. I'm going to create an easy DAC, okay? So if I type in easy DAC, it's going to auto-complete for me. And when I hit return, you'll notice that it changes shape here, okay? This is actually a user interface object. I'm going to go ahead and connect it to my cycle, okay? You connect simply by clicking and then dragging to make the connections. It's a click and drag motion. So you you click once on the outlet to get a cord, okay, which you can move around the screen. And then when you click to make the, con you should uh, drag down to the inlet and then make the connection, okay. If you get stuck with some extra sticky cord here that you want to get rid of, okay, uh, if you option, no, let's see, command, no, okay, yeah, command click gets rid of it, okay? So, again, I, I made a mistake and I, I don't need this anymore. If I command click, it goes away. Yeah, ISIS. Two questions. Hmm? Um, how many, like, light things do we need to connect them to, the, to an object? And does it matter where the object is connected to? Like, where is the light comes from? Like, say that instead of, you could put it, instead of um, that line coming from the bottom, mm -hmm. Yeah, it does matter. Okay, good. So good question. Isis's question is whether it matters whether things come from the top or the bottom. Okay. Uh, remember this diagram. Okay. Output is on the bottom of the object. Input is on the top. Okay. So you wouldn't connect an input to an input. You always connect an output to an input. Okay. Or an input to an output. Okay. But you need to have outputs going to inputs but not inputs to inputs, okay? It, the max environment doesn't work that way, okay? Can you the outputs on the specific objects? What now? Can you the outputs on objects or no? Uh, depends on the object. So good question. So she's asking about, can you increase the number of outlets? Some actually, based on their behavior, based on arguments that you add to the object, okay? Um, so if I hit space on this cycle object and I type in 20, you're going to see that it actually creates 20 outlets. Okay, because that's core part of its functionality on the, the cycle object. I don't get the same effect. Get rid of that. Okay, here. You notice it does not grow 20 object, 20 outlets, because it has a different function than the cycle non tilde. Okay. Okay, so it all depends on the functionality. Okay, we're not actually going to use the cycle the cycle object without the tilde today, okay? I just ha I wanted to demonstrate that the tilde matters because you're going to get a different behavior based on whether you add the tilde or not, okay? So in this case, 
uh, when I type in the argument, what does an argument do to an object? Yeah, it changes a parameter inside that object. Okay, in this case, the cycle object uh, it changes a parameter uh, for the frequency. Okay, so in this case, the twenty on the cycle tilde object sets the frequency at twenty hertz. Okay, so if I turn this on now, I don't know if my speakers can handle this. Yeah, they're moving. Everybody see that? So my speakers are actually moving at twenty hertz now. Okay. Okay, lovely. All right. They're not quite strong enough to actually hear the 20 hertz, okay? But if I uh, turn off the easy DAC, I unlock the patch, and this locking and unlocking the patch, okay? When you want to use the patch, you, you lock it, okay? You lock it down, you don't make any more changes. If you want to reprogram it, you unlock the patch, okay? That's this little lock icon down here at the bottom of the screen. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, is there a hot go, uh, Casey had a good question. Is there a hotkey for that? If you command click in any of the white space, it's it locks and unlocks the patch. Okay. Yeah, Marcus. Uh, I don't know why I can't open it on the speakers. Like, it's, not on. it's on all the time. Is your patch locked? Yeah, if it's not locked, you're not going to be able to turn on the, the speaker. <laughs> Okay, can you help him? Is that working or no? Yeah, Tony. Um, mine does work, but uh, it's much higher pitch than 20. Okay, when you typed in 20? Yeah. Okay, interesting. I'm going to just uh, change mine to 200. There's my 200 hertz, okay? Um, but I should be able to change it that way. Try that out interactively and make sure that works for you guys. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Christian, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's key. This, this lock and unlock functionality is depending on, uh, is will change the behavior of being able to turn the speaker on and off. Okay. We got that? Oh no! Yeah. So yeah, Tony. Tony uh, uh, brings up a good point. So he, so here's what ha here's what was happening with Tony because he's like, where's this high frequency coming from, right? Um, when multiple patches are open and you're using the Easy DAC, it turns on all of the patches. Okay. So you need to pay attention to the fact that you've got multiple patches open. What was happening for Tony is he's hearing this in the background at the same time he's got this on. Let's see. Okay, so now I've got two, it, it looks like I've got one thing going on here, but actually because both of these patches are open, okay, it's, they're both on, okay? So be careful about that, when you ha especially early on. I would encourage you to focus on one patch at a time early in your Mac's career, okay? Okay? Okay. So uh, we changed the frequency based on using the argument, okay? Let's now use a message. Okay, uh, the message is right here next to the object in the toolbar. Again, if you're a mouse person, and you'll notice that it's a it's a, a keystroke difference of M. So you'll find me just simply typing M. Uh, I don't know. Pick three frequencies. Maybe let's pick uh, octaves of an A. Okay, because that's easy to know that 220, 440, 880. And then what do we have beyond that? 1760, actually. So, And then I'm going to connect those to my cycle object, to the very first inlet, because the first inlet changes frequency. 
How do I know that? Well, if I hover over that inlet while it's unlocked, I get a little floating uh, information, okay? So much like how Live had that info view in the lower left-hand corner, okay? Max shows you information by floating inf uh, little bubbles popping up and showing you the piece of information, okay? So you know that when you send information into this inlet, you're actually changing the frequency of it, okay? Okay? And I did, I, I, I maybe did something a little, I, I don't want to gloss over, I, I, you can use the M key to create message boxes all day long, okay? And then type information into them. Um, I was also doing another trick that I, I like to do, which is to option click drag. If you know that from other uh, graphic environments where you duplicate something, if you option click drag, it duplicates the object, okay? So now when I turn this, if I lock the patch and turn this on, Lovely, okay. Make sense? You're not getting multiples? Okay. Yeah, you should only hear one tone. So yeah, Catherine's point is a good one. Uh, monophonic. What does monophonic mean? One, yeah, one note, right? Okay. Uh, I think it's Keith Emerson told an a interesting. Uh, I think it was Keith Emerson. Yeah, one of the one of the great early synthesists uh, of uh, prog rock, basically, bought his first Moog from a guy who thought the Moog was broken because it only produced one note at a time. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, and he was like, it's not broken, it's monophonic, okay? Marcus. For what now? Lock and unlock, yeah. What was the shortcut for lock? Yeah, if you, uh, if you command click in the white space, it'll lock and unlock. Okay. So, uh, so uh, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this, right? We have messages open going to an object that has a changeable parameter. Mm -hmm. um, we click on the message, it's now sending information. Yeah. So Casey made a good point. Casey has a good question here. The cycle object has a parameter set to 200. As soon as we send the message in, it overwrites that 200 parameter. Okay? You can, you can think of the argument as the, the, the initial state, okay? But as soon as you change that information through a message going into the object, it overwrites that state with new information, okay? That can be a little confusing at first because you look at that and you're like, why isn't that cycle making a 200 hertz sine wave? It's because it's received new information, okay? Yeah, Casey. Two follow-up that. Um, I'm yeah. jumping on this one, but is there... I'm assuming that there are other objects that have multiple numbers for different parameters. Mm -hmm. I think we have like GB yeah. stuff from computer from programming. Yep. Um, does the does each object just know what information to relate to messages, or are we going to get specific in messages to make sure that we're right? Depends on the object. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> my second question was. I forgot them. Okay. Okay. Uh, Let's see here. What would be? Uh, I'm I'm finding myself at a crossroads because I could. Um, I'm looking at the time and making sure that we. Would you rather me go in a path that tracks mainly with what the reading was and kind of explains what some of those objects do, or would you rather me take these messages and show you a different path and maybe build something that arpeggiates between these frequencies that we've now set up. What? Choose your own adventure. This is like arpeggiating? New direction? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to delete this. Okay, I'm going to arpeggiate between these frequencies. Okay. Okay, I want to build something that's going to have a, a pulse to it, okay, a metronomic pulse, okay, metronome, okay. Uh, the object for that is the metro object, okay. Metro object takes one parameter, which is the interval, the number of milliseconds between pulses, okay. Uh, so if I want this to be at 120 BPM, okay, I need it to pulse at every half second, okay? 
a half second is 500 milliseconds, okay? There's 1,000 milliseconds in one second, okay? So if, go ahead and type in metro space 500, okay? This is going to produce a pulse at 120 BPM, okay? And we're going to arpeggiate through these frequencies that we've lined up in message boxes here, okay? In order to do that, we need to actually uh, differentiate, let's see, Actually, can I do it? With, let me let me look real quick. I just thought of another way to do this because I'm wondering if I can do it this way. Cycle no, no cycle only takes. Oh, bang does go. Oh, cool. Okay, cool. We can actually use cycle and cycle. I was going to do this a different way because now what the cycle non tilde does. And I, I'll just I'll kind of step back at the meta level here. There's always more than one way to do something in Max. Okay, it's like any programming environment. There's multiple ways to do it. The question is, what's the best way to do it? Okay, uh, and this maybe is more direct and simpler. And I don't have to introduce two or three objects. I can I can use an object that we've uh, already introduced here. The cycle object without the tilde actually moves through these outlets uh, one by one in order. Okay, so as Pulses come in, it's going to rotate through them back around, okay, which is, should give us an arpeggiation feature to our patch, okay? Everybody got this? Okay, now we actually have to turn this on, right? We need an on off switch for our pulse, right? Much like the, the start stop play, that sort of thing, okay? The object for turning something on and on, on and off, is the toggle object, which you'll see up here at the top. It also has a keystroke, T for toggle, okay? It helps to know the names of things because it'll also help you remember the keystrokes, right? Because keystrokes often are the first letter of things, okay? If you start calling this on-off switch, okay, you might hit the O key and it does something different, okay? Toggle, okay? So this allows me to turn the metro on and off. Great, I just built an arpeggiator. We have an arpeggiator working. That's lovely. We got a bunch of lovely arpeggiators here in the room. Okay. All right. So, what's what are some things we might want this arpeggiator to do other than cycle through octaves of A? I mean, what are this is where you start to ask questions of yourself, like, I really would like it to do this. What I mean, I mean, is does, do I always want to cycle through A octaves, Katie? Well, could you make it go randomly? Ah, randomly, okay. Uh, that might, hmm. I'd have to introduce a few different objects for that. Let me come back to that one, okay? It's going to be too big. Right? Okay, uh, let's stay monophonic. Okay, but yeah, having them play at the same time, right? Okay, we have them. We might have. We might need multiple cycles at that point. Okay. Changing the order. Changing the order. Okay. What about playing different pitches? Yeah, we can change different numbers. Yeah, because right now I have to actually unlock the patch and reprogram it to get different pitches out of it. Right. What if? Changing the pitch was actually something that I could change at, at runtime that I could interactively make happen with my my patch. Okay, so uh, let's do that, and then I'm going to come back to the randomize. I can see if I can do that real quick. Okay, yeah. Somebody figure out how to change the tempo because this. Yeah, if you float over this, uh, you'll notice that this inlet, the first inlet is turning it on and off. The second one is actually changing the interval time and allows you to change how fast the pulse is going, okay? Uh, these message boxes actually have two inlets, and you notice if the second inlet on these actually sets what the message is. So if we can build something that would put a new message in this box, I would be able to um, change what the frequency is, okay? So what I'm going to do here, uh, let's see. Uh, if you remember, on the first day, I introduced you to the MTOF object. And actually, I, should, I glossed over that a little too fast. But you should see that, I guess, one of the features of this list is that it actually gives you a little one-line description of it. 
convert a MIDI note number to a frequency, all right? Because not many people walk around in their head with the frequencies of all the different note, notes on the MIDI keyboard, right? Okay, not many people do that, I will admit, okay? But if I connect that to my message box, and then if I build, I create what's called a case slider. Type in case slider and hit return and watch what happens. Automagically you have a little graphical keyboard to play with, okay? Because most of you that are musicians, uh, have this is more how you think about pitch rather than MIDI note numbers, right? Okay. The, the main thing you want to do is think about the user, whether the user is you or someone else, okay? What's going to be the piece of information that makes the most sense to them, okay? It might not be frequency, it's probably not MIDI note number, but looking at a piano keyboard, most people have seen that and know that they can punch on the key and have a certain frequency uh, happen, okay? So I'm gonna, let's see, I'm gonna all move this over, okay? So now if I hit this and turn it on, and I play this, See how every time I play a different key, it's actually changing the frequency in that last box? Okay. So I've changed one box. What if I want to change all four of them? Well, this is where my option click drag comes in play. Okay. So if I click, drag, click, drag, I might need to make my patch a little bit smaller. Yeah, uh, and I'm gonna just intuitively move this one over here. I uh, can't get to that one. Make it a little bit smaller so I can reach the bottom there. So now I've got two case slider keyboards, or three, or four, I could count, right? Um, okay, turn this on, and now I can... follow along with that? I know I kind of moved quickly here, okay, toward the end. Uh, I've got no minutes left. <laughs> Randomizing. Okay, I'd actually need to introduce a couple objects in order to do that, but if I change this to select, and I'm going to do one, this is the select object, not Celeste, select, one, two, three, four, Actually, I, let me start with uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. And then instead of my pulse cycling through, if I simply create a random object, 5, or excuse me, no, 4. And if you've got to go, go. But this should just take me another minute here. Now... If I add a number box here, okay, I'm now randomly moving through these four pitches that I've selected, okay? Start to dive into this, start to play around with this. There's a lot that you can do here, okay? Um, I mean, again, we're just starting to scratch the surface, and it, it will happily play at, at an interval of a... If you want to go faster than that. Yes, Hunter. So this is how instruments is, like, this is how plugins instruments are made for a This is... This is a way to make instruments for me. Not all instruments are made this way, but it's it's a way that you is accessible to you to make instruments for Ableton Live. Okay? Yeah. Good to clarify that. Not all of them are made this way, but it's just it's a way. Okay? We have to end there. 
we'll play around with this some more. Uh, make sure you do the reading for Friday. We do have a guest on Friday who's going to talk about the synthy. Okay. I will see you all then.